Hi, my name is Liz and this is the Pink Lookbook. I recently went to Milan and while most people associate shopping with the city, there's actually so much more to do in terms of arts and culture. And on this trip, I visited the Armani Silos, which is the museum founded by Giorgio Armani. And I have to admit, it was kind of a surprise. It was very unexpected, I have to say, because I went into the museum expecting the typical Armani designs the clean lines, the suits, the beautiful evening wear. But uh, yet again, it showed me uh, the big inspiration of traveling for artists and designers. And as you may know, I'm also very passionate about traveling. I also take a lot of inspiration from my trips. And this uh, museum or the permanent exhibition of Giorgio Armani's designs yet again showed that this is another designer who was very heavily influenced by other countries, other culture. It did not really matter if he actually visited the countries. And this is similar to what I said about Karl Lagerfeld or Yves Saint Laurent in my videos. It seems that a lot Lot of these designers travel in their mind, they make up a fantastical version of these countries and then they incorporate the elements of these designs. Let's take a trip around the world today to the countries that inspired Giorgio Armani. Please fasten your seatbelts, we are soon taking off and while we are taxiing I would quickly like to explain the Armani silos to you because it's also kind of interesting to see what this museum actually has to show. Giorgio Armani imagined this space to show according to the leaflet a glimpse into his world. So he wanted to juxtapose fashion with other disciplines such as photography, sculpture, architecture. And the latter is quite an important point because the whole building is quite an interesting architectural concept. As the name suggests, silos in English, it's uh, a building that used to store cereals. It was built in the 1950s and now it was transformed into this art space. Uh, it looks very clean. It's quite interesting to walk around and just simply look at the building. And it's uh, a museum that stretches over 4,500 square meters and it has four floors. And there is a separation between the permanent exhibition and temporary exhibitions when I just when there was a temporary photo exhibition and on the two top floors there was uh, the permanent exhibition and there's also a digital archive where you can learn more about specific designs of Giorgio Armani. The permanent exhibition is divided into two parts, the voyage part and the glamour part. The voyage, as you can imagine, is about inspirations from all the world that uh, inspired Giorgio Armani. Glamour is the evening wear, the glamorous gowns that he created. Needless to say, I'm focusing on this voyage part, the inspirations from around the world. But I also found some interesting examples in the glamour part. So the lines are a bit blurry. We are going to switch between those two parts. And needless to say, there were many of the typical Armani designs. Giorgio Armani opened his own business in the 1970s and this was the time when women already had gained more and more rights, they felt more empowered and Armani not only focused on this movement but he also benefited from it because he gave this new movement also new clothing appropriate for their careers and he also played a bit with the roles because he took men's wear inspired garments and made them for women and vice versa. Now this would be the stereotype Armani but today I would like to focus on a different facet of the designer because as I said in my introduction I was also very surprised to see this because I went in expecting the stereotype, the clean designs, and then I saw how many designs were actually inspired by other cultures or countries. Sometimes this inspiration is more obvious, sometimes it's more subtle, and I would like to share this with you because I think this is something worth knowing about Armani as well. And I would like to share a quote here with you because, again, it reminded me of uh, Karl Lagerfeld, what I said in my video about his Orientalism, and also Yves Saint Laurent, about their approach to traveling. I like to fantasize looking elsewhere and traveling with the mind is an intense and fulfilling way of reinventing what I create in the here and now. It is a way of dreaming with my feet on the ground. And this is exactly what I find so interesting because it's not always a literal uh, interpretation of garments or traditions. It's these elements that he takes and uh, it's not explicit in uh, the museum, but I assume it's similar to Lagerfeld or Yves Saint Laurent that either he traveled to certain regions or he was inspired by travel reports, by books, by documentaries. Uh, I think it's this mix that really makes his design. 
And one side note that I would like to make here, uh, sometimes I will refer to certain countries, for example, I will say India, but I know that uh, many garments uh, or techniques from India are also very prevalent in other countries, for example, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, or many more. So please forgive me if I only say one country. If you see something particular to a certain country or region that you would like to point out, please feel free and let me know in the comments below. And a quick other side note, this is a non-sponsored video and I'm just sharing my opinion and my experience from the museum here. And now we are ready for takeoff from Milan and we don't have to travel too far. Our first destination is Paris. And the first example that I would like to share with you is a beautiful bustier dress from the fall winter 1993-1994 collection. It's very colorful, it's made from ribbons. And according to the information from the museum, the color palette was, I quote, stolen from Matisse's palette. So this bustier dress was inspired by the French impressionist painter Henri Matisse and it was not the only uh, example of this uh, inspiration in the collection. Uh, in the exhibition you can also find another ensemble, a beautiful pantsuit, which is very intricately embroidered and it has a flower pattern. And when I looked at it, I actually thought, oh, it looks like an impressionist painting. I only found out that this was uh, the inspiration a bit later. And it is interesting because it's a fall winter collection, but when we look at the colors, it's colorful, it's bright, and this is exactly what Giorgio Armani wanted to achieve. He said he wanted to play with this notion because usually we associate muted colors, dark colors with uh, autumn, winter, but he thought why not have something bright and colorful, which I actually really like. And I think this might be another take on the French Impressionists because they also saw light very differently. So maybe Armani took this from the painters and reflected this in his collection as well. And then I saw another interesting design from the Spring Summer 1990 collection. It was kind of this interesting mix. There was this blouse and there was a circle skirt. There were trousers, tulle, silk. So this interesting mix. And I was already thinking this reminds me of something, but I could not really uh, decide at the museum. I had to do my research afterwards. And then I also found out that Armani was actually inspired by the Ballet Russe. And the Ballet Russe were a ballet which was very famous in the first half of the 20th century. And many designers were actually inspired by the Ballet Russe because they had these fantastical costumes and showed different countries and cultures. For this, Armani was inspired by Leon Bax, who was a costume designer for the Ballet Russe. He was not the only one, but probably one of the more known ones. And uh, also there's another link to Paris and France because uh, the designer Paul Poiret was also heavily influenced not only by the Ballet Russe but also by uh, the so-called Orient back then and he very often incorporated elements for example from Persian princes into his designs. He also hosted these parties where he asked people to dress up and when I prepared for this video and looked at this ensemble again I realized that this was actually what I was thinking about. I thought about Paul Poiret and his designs with the heavy embroideries, the vibrant colors and these influences uh, from the east. And now we have a longer flight ahead of us because we are going to China. For his spring summer collection 2005, Giorgio Armani mixed something quite interesting. We see Chinese elements. This is what immediately caught my eye. But then I saw some elements where I was like, hmm, interesting, I've seen this before. Where did I see this? And then I found out that he also incorporated elements by the French designer Elsa Schiaparelli. And when you look closer, you see the turbans, the headpieces, the big brooches. And then he mixed that with Chinese elements. And I found this quite interesting. And this collection is also referred to as shocking, which is a term that we actually associate with Elsa Schiaparelli. So he kind of paid tribute to this French designer. The first example is an obvious one, but also a very beautiful one. It's this yellow dress and we see elements referencing Chinese painting. We see birds and flowers and this actually references a style in Chinese painting, which is called bird and flower painting. 
called Hua Nia Hua in Chinese. And from the same collection, there was a dress at the exhibition with Chinese characters. And this was not the only example in this collection because there was also a jacket with these uh, calligraphy characters. Uh, there was also another dress where it was not only black and white, but also with red, which is also very typical of Chinese calligraphy. Of course, we also see garments with the signature Chinese shapes. Needless to say, there were stand-up collars. Uh, there were also tops referencing the famous Chinese porcelain in white and blue. And he also took up the Chinese shapes uh, in quite a few accessories. And also to put this into context, we are talking here about a spring-summer collection for 2005. And this was the tail end of an overall trend. As I mentioned in my video about fashion trends uh, around the year 2000, China was a big source of inspiration for many designers. There were also other examples, for example, Jean-Paul Gaultier or Roberto Cavalli. And also for Armani, this was not the only collection. He was also inspired for other collections by China. And a much earlier example would be his spring-summer collection from 1993. He has beautiful embroideries referencing Chinese or Japanese art again. I was actually kneeling down at the museum. I got quite some looks for it, but this uh, embroidery was just so beautiful. And on the one hand, it reminded me of the Chinese painting style, but also of something else. It again reminded me of the lacquer furniture, which was imported from China and Japan in the 18th and 19th century. I talked about this in my video about Karl Lagerfeld's Orientalism. It was uh, quite a big trend to buy these very expensive lacquer pieces. And this lacquer furniture, like the painting style, showed genre scenes, for example, from the upper class or the life at the imperial court. And we can also see these like small strokes or waves. And this is always the sign that uh, there is water and with uh, Chinese painting styles, uh, there is no real difference in the dimension like we have it in European art. So this is another nod to this East Asian painting style. And of course, we also see the popular flowers, which are a signature element of this type of art. And Armani also took this up in an exhibited jacket and also black and white dresses from the fall winter collection 1995 and 96 and the spring summer collection 1997. And for his fall winter 1995-96 collection, Armani also incorporated the lotus flower, which is very important. It has a big meaning in Chinese art. Lotus called Lianhua in Chinese has a close link to Buddhism because uh, the fruit, the stem and the blossom stand for the past, the present and the future. And also people say that the lotus grows out of the mud, actually the dirt, but is something very pure. It's not dirty. So it also shows that uh, people can be good even if the environment around them is bad, they can have a pure heart. Furthermore, the lotus flower also stands for marriage and love. And where does this come from? In the Chinese language, we have a lot of homophones. This means that one character Character sounds like another character. In the case of Lotus, Lian Hua, uh, we have Lian, which can also sound like Lian, connect, and also Lian, love. So this is also where a lot of this symbolism comes from in Chinese art. My first thought when I saw this pattern was, yes, this is taken from China, but the more I looked at it, I was not really sure if it's only China because the lotus flower is also a very important flower in other countries and cultures, for example, in India. So as you will see, uh, Armani sometimes mixes many cultures and it's quite difficult to determine where the inspiration comes from. But given the strong focus of this fall winter collection 1995-96, I think in this case he was inspired by Chinese art. Now I've talked about this more obvious examples, but when you walk through the exhibition you will find many other ensembles with references to China. For example, there are accessories with this typical knotted uh, design and there were also some ensembles featuring ginkgo leaves from the tree which is uh, quite a popular motif across Asia. The more we walk through this exhibition the more we see that Armani 
mixed a lot of countries and cultures even within one garment so it's sometimes very difficult to just link one garment to one particular country. I also discovered some interesting patterns. I think they depict people from Oceania or the Pacific Islands but I'm not really sure. If you know more about this I would appreciate if you could let me know in the comments below. Now let's take off to our next destination. We are going to Japan and for his fall winter collection for 1981-1982 Armani was clearly inspired by Japan. We have quite a few ensembles. There's a black velvet ensemble, there is a blue ensemble, there's also a black ensemble with uh, red details and all of these designs were inspired by the Oyoroi armor of the samurai and this was an overall trend in fashion because the 1980s were heavily influenced by Japan. Again we can see the clean lines, the geometry and as I mentioned previously in the 1970s and 80s Armani designed for the needs of the career women and very often he took up also elements from Japan for these designs. Maybe not these ensembles that I just showed but also these clean lines and shaped clearly influenced him as well. And also Japan inspired Armani's menswear like this example uh, this jacket from 1999 but again it is Japanese inspired but it could also take some inspiration from other Asian countries. And I would also like to show you this design which is quite interesting. It's not necessarily only Japanese inspired but I would like to show it here. It is a hybrid between Japan and France for the reason that it is clearly art deco inspired inspired and the Art Deco or the Jugendstil in Austria were heavily inspired by Japan. I said this in other videos. After the Paris Expo in 1867 um, many artists and designers uh, took inspiration from Japanese art and we can clearly see this also in this dress. The clear shapes, the flower elements, they are Art Deco or Japanese uh, inspired. So I also found this quite interesting and I wanted to show this to you before we take off to our next destination. And we have reached our last destination of our trip. India may be my favorite one because from the late 1980s onwards Armani was heavily inspired by India. As I mentioned in my introduction we are not talking only about India here. There are many other countries with similar garments and traditions. For example Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey and many more. I want to keep this video simple so please forgive me if I only refer to India here. I have two quite obvious examples here from the 1989-1990 collection and the spring-summer 1990 collection. The first one is this beautiful golden dress which has a sheer layer and underneath we see the bote pattern and the second example is this top that reminds me of the tops you wear with an Indian lenga skirt uh, and it also features this bote pattern. Pattern. The Bote pattern originated from Persia and then traveled around the region and reached India. And today many people know this Bote pattern under the name of Paisley because it was actually appropriated in the Scottish town of Paisley. Paisley became a big producer of cashmere and then they took up the Indian patterns. And this is one of the reasons why many people have forgotten the original name and only know this pattern under the name Paisley. And this very same pattern I also spotted again on the top floor. Unfortunately I did not note down the year of the collection but it was uh, three gowns uh, in in an ivory tone and uh, before even seeing the pattern they immediately reminded me also of Indian bridal wear because at the moment it's also a trend to wear like white or ivory which I find a bit of a shame to be honest because uh, what makes uh, Indian bridal wear is actually the colors but this is a different story but again we see the shapes uh, like the big skirts and we can also see at a closer look the bote pattern again. And then there's this beautiful crop top and again I could not determine determine one particular country as a source of inspiration and maybe again he was rather inspired by Paul Poiré than one particular country and took many elements uh, into this design. So maybe it's this whole oriental influence. As you can see I have my difficulty with the term. I also discussed this term in more detail in my video about Karl Lagerfeld's orientalism. And throughout the exhibition uh, you will see there are a lot of ensembles with draping. Uh, very often they reference saris. Uh, Sometimes they also reference the Indian dhoti trousers. And then another beautiful ensemble is this uh, gold brown ensemble from the fall winter 1990-1991 collection. 
I can't really say which country was the particular influence, but for me it was uh, again a reference to gold brocade and it could just be a contemporary version uh, of uh, traditional Indian fabrics. And I would like to end our trip around the world with my favorite ensembles. They immediately caught my eye. It's spring summer 1993. They were so colorful and I think they were clearly Indian inspired. Uh, there was uh, intricate embroidery, uh, some of the borders reminded me of the borders on saris. They are, were tropical plants, so again, I'm not sure if this was a reference to India or to traveling overall, but I just like the ensemble. This would be something that I would immediately take and wear, I have to admit. And then there was a similar brown ensemble, but uh, this sleeveless jacket for me was more a reference to countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan. It was also a very beautiful interpretation. And then I found two interesting ensembles in the glamour section. It was uh, waistcoats without sleeves. They were intricately embroidered, paired with lace skirts. So already this combination was quite interesting, but when you look closely, you can see, especially with the black version, there are these geometric shapes and they actually reminded me of Mughal architecture, especially garden architecture. For example, when you go to uh, Rajasthan and you visit the Amber Fort near Jaipur, you can see similar shapes uh, in the gardens, for example, for the Saffron Garden. And now we have landed back in Milan and I hope you found it as interesting as me to see the different facet of Giorgio Armani. I personally found it really interesting to see yet another design who travels in his mind and gets all these inspirations from different countries and cultures. But I'm also curious about you. Did you know about this dimension of Giorgio Armani and what do you think about it? Do you have anything to add to the different countries or to the different designs? Please let me know in the comments below. I appreciate our discussion. And if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate it if you could like and subscribe. Also head over to thepinklookbook.com for more fashion related articles and maybe you want to check out my own fashion label Pelagona. If you enjoyed this video it might be interesting for you to watch my other video about the Chanel exhibition in London. Thank you very much for watching this video and see you soon.